Okay, so now we have been working with GDP, have an understanding of, of how it's defined, of how it's measured, what's included, and is what is not included. It's worth mentioning that even though it's used a lot in it's used a lot as a statistic to compare one country to another or to show growth in the economy within one country. And it is a good measure, but it is just a metric, and it does have its flaws. And some of its flaws are really because it's being used for more than it was maybe designed for um, when it was originally created. So it's worth at least acknowledging these things. It doesn't mean we need to toss it out, but it reminds us that when we do see statistical analyses based on GDP, that you know, in the back of your mind, just remember it's just a measurement. So let's look at a few of them. Basically, it comes down to what it might not be capturing as far as truly measuring production, which is what it's supposed to do, is measure the productive capacity, the value that an economy can produce. That's one thing. And then the other big category that might be worth keeping in mind is GDP is used, it sort of implies, or it's sort of assumed by all, that if GDP is higher in one country than another, the country with the higher GDP is a better place to live. And so is that true? Is it really also a measure of well-being? So there's production shortcomings and a measure of well-being shortcomings. And those are the two things we just want to address in this video. So as far as um, measuring the production in the economy, its actual intent, there are um, two issues we might want to be aware of uh, when we start talking about it. One is this household production and one is the underground economy. Household production is, if we think about the verbal definition of GDP, there was the description that it was the market value of the goods and services produced for the marketplace. Um, and so what is, what is that omitting? That's omitting things that are productive activities that would be included in GDP if you paid somebody to do it. But if you do it yourself, we don't include it. And honestly, how would you? And so let me give you an example. Um, taking care of your own children you don't get paid for. But if you had somebody else do it, you'd have to pay them. You'd have to pay a babysitter, you'd have to pay a nanny. So when you take care of your own children, you are providing a service that has value, but it doesn't have a monetary value because it's done within your household. Cleaning your house, cooking, all of these things. Um, and so when you have goods and services that people are producing for themselves outside the marketplace, that is obviously not going to be included in GDP. And it would be very difficult to price it and to collect the data, and so we just don't include it. And it's not included, like I said, in the verbal definition. We're looking at the um, goods and services produced for the marketplace in GDP. So it's fine that it's not in there. We just have to acknowledge it's not in there. And you have to keep in mind when you're looking at GDP, particularly in, in developing countries, that have more informal production. They have more production done at home. You have more people who are self-sufficient, living in um, maybe some sort of farming environment. Uh, none of their household activities are going to have a market value attached to it. So the stated GDP figure for such a country is not including everybody's activity. And that's just something to keep in mind. So household production is obviously not included. And the other thing is this underground economy. Well, this one's because it's illegal and therefore it shouldn't be happening and we're not going to be able to track the data. That's the kind of the idea with it. Um, people could be doing something where they're buying and selling something that actually is illegal, or they could be doing an activity that is legal, but they're trying to avoid taxes, and so they're doing sort of a cash payment under the table sort of thing. Those are the sorts of things that aren't easily tracked for obvious reasons and included in GDP. However, and you can research this on your own if you're intrigued, there has been a recent change at the international level for all those countries that have to agree on, on what we're going to include in GDP that allows countries to try and make an estimate on things that maybe have been illegal. Um, prostitution, um, maybe drugs, some of the, those sorts of things um, are beginning to be included in GDP. So this underground economy might be a smaller flaw going forward. Um, but in general, household production, underground economy, those are the two things that are examples of some sort of productive activity happening, something that is, you know, God it does have a value to it, but it's not being valued and captured and included in GDP.
All right, so that's the two ways that the GDP might have a shortcoming as far as measuring production. Now we want to turn to four ways it might have a shortcoming, or it does have shortcomings, as far as being a measure for well-being. A lot of these issues have to do with comparing one country's GDP to another um, and trying to draw conclusions from it. So I'll just go through these and then I'll, I'll kind of sum up how, how much this might matter when you're actually looking at country to country. So there's four of them. GDP does not include leisure. Um, it is not reduced by negative effects of production. GDP does not reflect any sort of social problems. And it also would not give you any indication of income equality or income inequality. So let's look at the first one. GDP does not include leisure. Um, so if I'm looking at two countries, they have similar GDPs. One's a little higher than the other. I'm thinking, hey, I want to live there. They have higher GDP. It'd be a better country to live in. Um, just the point of this particular issue is that maybe the country with the lower GDP, they work less. They have more leisure time. Maybe it's a more enjoyable lifestyle. Of course, all of this is very subjective, but it is a, an acknowledgement. We're just wanting to acknowledge that more leisure could result in higher well-being, but because it's leisure, it's not producing something for the marketplace, and therefore the GDP could be lower. So just a, a thing to keep in mind when comparing GDP across countries. Okay, another one here is GDP is not reduced by pollution or other negative effects of production. And China is a good example of this. China has had outstanding growth in their GDP over the last decade or so. And this is not to take away from that, but it is to acknowledge that they've also had significant growth in air pollution, water pollution. You would not have to go far to find articles in Google about all the problems with pollution China is having. When you're gathering the GDP data, you are gathering dollar amounts of what's being produced, and there's nothing to subtract away the amount of production pollution that is also being produced. Um, and so it's just something, again, to keep in mind that you can look at the growth rate of China's GDP and say, ooh, I want to live in a country that has such fast growth rate, but it does not show you one way or the other that there might be some side effects of this production like pollution. All right, number three, GDP does not reflect crime levels or other social problems. Um, you could look at two countries again. One country has a higher GDP than the other. Think, hey, I want to live there. But remember, one of the four components of GDP is government, government spending. So maybe the government's spending a lot of money on police and um, maybe doing some other things that's their purchases to um, try to deal with other social problems. So all of these sorts of spending could show a GDP being higher, but it's not uh, something that's improving well-being. It's something that's uh, because the country has problems um, that's requiring the government to, to spend. I don't know how much this is really a significant problem. Um, most countries that have lawless problems don't also have a lot of government spending. You're talking about a failed state. But again, um, just like not including leisure, um, you can't draw a conclusion just because the GDP is a little lower, it's necessarily not as good of a country to live in. Same thing here, just because the GDP might be a little bit lower doesn't mean it's necessarily worse to live in. Because with the higher GDP, who knows, maybe they're spending it on things trying to deal with crime, etc. And then the fourth one here, GDP does not indicate income equality. Um, it is theoretically possible that you could have a country with what appears to be a fairly high GDP level, but when you actually break down who holds the income, maybe you know the top 10% have a significant portion of the income and the rest are living at subsistence level. Uh, you might look at two countries, they have similar GDPs, but one has a fairly more equal income distribution and one has that very unequal one. And so this is just an acknowledgement that if you only looked at GDP, you're not getting the whole picture. Surprise, right? I'm sure that was shocking for you. Um, but that's really what all of these four issues about well-being are about, is that when you only focus on GDP, um, you might be missing some other issues going on. And so these are the four specific other issues that we are learning about here for the GDP as a measure of well-being. Now, all of that is said, and none of this I'm, I'm, I'm throwing out, but I do want to point out that they have made various attempts to create other measurements
they being either the UN or maybe the World Bank, some of these international institutions, where they're trying to come up with a good measure that, that allows us to do comparisons across countries. And there was one, I think the UN came up with, where they use GDP as one piece of data and then they include some of these other lifestyle issues. And it was interesting because even after doing all that extra work, it did change the order of the countries, but if you looked at like, sections like this is the top 10 and then this is the next 10 and that's the next 10 the clusters kind of stayed in order and then within a cluster you would have some reorganization so all i'm saying is that yes gdp has all these flaws but it seems to actually correlate pretty well um, higher gdp with better standard of living and i think that's why you keep seeing these sorts of um, statistics reported, this sort of analysis done, because in general we are looking, especially in economics, at growth rate and GDP in an attempt to raise the standard of living. All right, any discussion of flaws with GDP would be um, would not be complete without at least mentioning this other issue. Um, there is something called the fallacy of the broken window. Um, it's a long-standing story. Um, but the idea is that if you had somebody who was saving money up to a business, let's say, to save money up to, to invest in his business, and before he gets around to making that investment, his window gets broken. So he has to take that money and spend it on the window. Obviously, you got to have a window that's not a hole. Um, so he spends the money, and that would show up in GDP. But... And it would be somebody's income, right? And then, of course, spending is the expenditure method. So however you want to see it, it's going to show up in GDP. But the problem is that the man hasn't really improved his business. This was money he was going to use elsewhere. So even though GDP is showing this improvement, it's improvement because of destruction. And what it's leaving out is what could that money have been used for? What more growth would you have had if he hadn't had to respond to this destruction? And so one of the ways we see this in GDP is natural disasters. Uh, maybe a hurricane, that sort of thing will, will sweep through, it will break a lot of things, it will cause a lot of things that need to be repaired, buildings, businesses, government infrastructure, all sorts of things. And you do, um, and there's an example here about Hurricane Katrina, that when it did hit, you do see a dip in GDP um, to reflect things like work being shut down, um, anything in the Louisiana area is going to shut down oil and gas. So there is this drop initially, but the overall total impact on GDP is actually a net positive because then you have to show, do all the rebuilding, the consumption, the investment, the government spending will all increase in order to rebuild. And so the point of the fallacy of the broken window as applied to GDP is you will see GDP rising. You know, you'd look at the data and say, oh, look at this, we have great growth, but it's not growth in the sense of something that's truly improving us. It's just trying to get us back to what had been destroyed previously. Um, and so that's just another thing to kind of keep in mind. It's one of these little funny things with GDP um, when you look at the statistics that you want to keep the whole picture in mind.